Headline Truth, a show where we get into some of the mysteries, anomalies, and the dirty underbelly of the world around us. I'm your host, Paul, and joining me, joining us this week, we have Jim Willie, who really needs no further introduction. Jim, are you there? I'm here. <clears throat> I've got my water next to me, so <laughs> I'll keep my keep my throttle dry. No, good, wet. Good. <clears throat> Okay. Wet. Well, you're in Central America. Some of those places are awfully wet. But um, anyway, thanks for coming. We appreciate it. And um, I guess uh, before we get into too many things, we would might want to mention your website, uh, The Golden Jackass. And uh, um, anything you've been up to lately? Any reports of note? Anything you want to mention? Well, there are 20 things. What, what I've noticed in the last couple of weeks and th this is this is special. I I had kind of a, a, a task with uh, a couple of colleagues of mine. We have a, a group of about nine or ten of us, and you know mm -hmm. we're, we we trade information, we trade opinions, we we provide ourselves with uh, you know what does this mean? Before I go public with an analysis, I I like to check with my my gang, and it's not a staff. They don't get paid. They're just a bunch of smart people who've developed with me a lot of trust so we we try to keep it at an inner sanctum of sorts anyway what seems to be happening now is 30 enormously important events all in the last few weeks i think we've got acceleration on the systemic breakdown globally the, these are all huge events um there I, I ask what stands out that for our listeners what might stand out well, I could just rattle off some. Um, OPEC decided not to uh, not to raise. I'm sorry. Not yeah. Wait a minute. Not not to cut production. All right. Mm -hmm. So the Saudis are killing OPEC. Um, their competition. Uh, China and India are, are working out for big barter deals. Uh, Deutsche Bank has stopped physical gold trading. Uh, there's a $250 rise in the gold market on Wednesday. I, I think it was a probe, a test. Uh, before COMEX is killed. Uh, India removed restrictions on gold imports. Uh, shale and oil gas sector in the United States is about to collapse from high yield junk bonds. Uh, Putin announced Russia is doing swimmingly. Uh, by the way, the, in Russian ruble terms, the oil price has not changed one bit. Um, Putin, Putin has oil and gas companies that are signing contracts. Turkey has worked out a deal with, uh, with Russia where they're not going to use the dollar. Turkey has some huge energy projects. Italy and France are uh, on their deathbed. Unemployment's going through the roof. Debt over GDP ratio out of sight. The Swiss referendums put at risk the entire Swiss uh, reserves and, and central banking system. The Japanese are having an, a snap election where I think they're going to dump Abe. I hope they do. He's nothing but a U.S. tool. U.S. bond yields are collapsing. JGB, uh, Japanese government bond, two yield is two year is now sporting a negative yield. The Ukraine gold is all gone. Uh, the Dutch have secretly announced that they've got some gold back, or so we're told. The French now want their gold back. Uh, these are repatriation issues. The gold forward rate has turned negative. Gold's in backwardization. Backwardation. Uh, German businesses want the sanctions removed. U.S. trade treaties are going nowhere, like the, the, the TPP, Trans-Pacific, and, and the European joke. They're, they're both nothing but uh, uh, corporate patents and power grabs. Um, China has signed an APAC deal. Uh, large oil companies in the United States have cut their capex, cut their dividends, cut their share buybacks. Uh, in the U.S., Auto loans and student loans are now the new subprimes. They're all going to go bust. Um, high, other than that, things are going well. Yeah, and, and notice that Ebola and ISIS are really exiting the news. Did Ebola and, even exist? <laughs> it sure does. No, I'm just kidding. But I mean, uh, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people who die of strange diseases in Africa, and all of a sudden... We've got to send military troops there, you know? Just kind of makes you wonder. Well, I can tell you a couple of angles of that. The Sierra Leone uh, laboratory that fabricated the extra powerful, uh, more communicable disease, Ebola, you know, new and improved Ebola virus that the Atlanta Center for Disease Control has a patent on. 
Uh, the Sierra Leone Laboratory is run by George Soros and Bill Gates of Microsoft. These two are trying to get elevated in their Mason rank among the Satanists. Um, well, you know, we're sending troops because the Red Cross workers are getting killed in uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone. Uh, what's another neighboring country? I, I, I don't have them all at the tip of my tongue. I'm not sure. Ghana, but there's another one in there. Um, Niger, I think. I'm not sure. But anyway, the Red Cross workers are getting killed by the natives because the natives are realizing the only ones made sick are the ones, no, the only ones who are sick were made sick by the vaccine. So they're killing the Red Cross workers and now U.S. military is going in there. By the way, the U.S. military that's going in there is getting their, themselves a special vaccine. So when they return to the United States, will they be delivering more? That's a good question, but uh, you know, Bill Gates' mother was on the board of the Red Cross, as I recall. So, and uh, his father was the head of Planned Parenthood, which of course is the modern, you know, eugenics crowd. So, <coughs> it's all in the family, is what I'm saying. It's nothing new for yeah. those guys. Yeah, and let's close it off by saying Obama just exerted uh, executive powers for. What was it? Free pardons for all the treason and the executive branch? Now, he cannot pardon himself, but he can well, set up things where all of his monkeys that work for him, the tools, they can all be pardoned. And I don't know if he can pardon Biden while he's still sitting, but these guys are working. The Obama administration is working feverishly to reduce the criminal pen penalties of treason. So that it's, you know, kind of like, uh, well, he stole $1,000. You know, what's the big deal? He's a traitor. What's the big deal? Boy, <laughs> what could one say? We could get into the politics forever. But I tell you what, why don't we get into some of the, the stuff that your subscribers okay. care most about, which is the more business, financial, what you call, what, the global money war? Yes, is I that do. The term, that's the term you like to use, and that's really quite appropriate. So... Uh, why don't we start with some of these um, grand trade deals? I mean, I see so much going on. You mentioned a minute ago the one with Turkey, Turkey and Russia, but they're all over the place. I'm here in Asia, and I just they, – they're not worthy of note. Everybody's doing it. I would think that the percentage of the world's transactions that are occurring in dollars must be collapsing. It must be going down very quickly. Well, it probably is, and, and the funny part is that it's nowhere near zero. Um, it, about 10 years ago, I'm, I'm just going to take some numbers off the top of my head. I don't think these are exactly right, but 10 years ago, something like 70, 72 percent of all global trade was in dollars. The euro was up there. The British pound was up there. Um, and now in dollar, for do, the dollar percentage of global trade, I, I think it's something on the order of 38, 37, 35 percent. So it's still up there. You just look at it this way. The U.S., and Canada, and the U.S., and Western Europe, and the U.S., and Britain, we're still doing dollar trade. So, you know, that has not changed. Uh, I, I agree with you. Asia is doing a tremendous amount of, uh, of trade and a tremendous amount of projects and, and large deals. Uh, but the West is not. The West is making deals like, okay, NSA will be infiltrating in your system and you're going to have to deal with it. Okay, the government says, fine, thanks for keeping us safe. The U.S. comes in and says, we've got some arms that we want you to, to buy and we have some missiles we want to put in place. So these are the American, these are the U.S. activities while the East, Asia, is doing free trade zone activity, uh, yuan swap facility activity. Customs union activity, large energy deal activity. Um, the the list is very long, and I covered my hat trick letter. Uh, a lot of the, the the more important deals. We have deals now between Russia and South America for supplying food. The Brazil Argentine deal was just struck, where they made an agreement not to use dollars in any bilateral trade, and the Mercosur which is uh, kind of a trade pact for South American nations, it's going to follow the Brazilian model. So 
before long, like in another year or so, there may not be any bilateral trade between South American nations that's in the dollar. It begs the question, in a few years, what trade will be in the dollar except for Western Europe, England, and North America, not England, but Great Britain and North America? I don't know. I mean, we, we have a, an RMB, RMB, you know, a Chinese yuan center. We're going to have to start defining things pretty soon because uh, the Chinese have set up an RMB hub in Toronto and in Vancouver. And my understanding, and I might not be right, but, you know, it's probably close. An RMB center is a bond issuance center in yuan currency, like, say, McDonald's or some mining company in Canada. It, it is issued in the Chinese currency. And the other function is a large scale currency translation between the yuan and a lot of other currencies. There was just a news article, a news announcement made by the Los Angeles city government that they're opening up a yuan center uh, right across the street from, I, I think, one of their big banks, ICB. ICBC Bank, Internet, what's that? International Commerce and Banking Corporation? I don't know. I, I, I get confused on so many Chinese acronyms. Um, so we got Chinese hubs or RMB pillboxes, whatever you want to call them, uh, three of them in North America. And I didn't expect that there would be one in the United States. I think we might see one pretty soon in, in Chase Manhattan's bank headquarters in South Manhattan because the Americans don't own it anymore. Yeah, well, that would that's a, such a total irony. Maybe the World Trade Towers the, <laughs> can be bought by them, the Twin Towers. Um, and, of course, uh, talking about these big deals, I suppose the Russia-China oil, uh, not oil, um, gas deals are a sign of what's coming. Yeah, and, you know, it, it's hard to even wrap your arms around it because the scope is so big. I believe it's something on the order of a $300 billion deal, but it just got extended because the Russians have announced now plans for construction of what they call the Altai, A-L-T-A-I, the Altai uh, gas pipeline that is not going to go to the Pacific end, but will go to the western end of China, uh, going straight down from Siberian sources. And, and that's, you know, I, I don't know exactly. It, it's another, let's say, 60, 80 billion dollars in the next two decades or more. These are not dollar-based um, trade plans. They're dollar-based construction plans. And here's what I mean by that. When it comes to the actual construction, uh, the Chinese are going to pitch in treasury dollars, treasury bonds. So a lot of the work will be done dumping U.S. currency. And the Russians are really, they're not desperate, but they're urgently seeking uh, more cash flow, especially on the investment side. And that's why they're cutting so many deals. The sanctions are really forcing Russia into making a lot of different uh, deals and packs and you know customs arrangements and whatever, because it's going to increase their cash flow when the flow from Europe is not exactly drying up, but is sharply reduced. So the construction side of the Holy Grail energy deal with China and Russia is going to be financed by dumping treasury bonds, which has a name, indirect exchange. And I, I had the first pleasure of learning a lot about that when British Petroleum sold their stake of TPP, uh, British Petroleum in Russia, a subsidiary. They sold it to Rosneft. And the, the Russians announced that they were going to uh, pay something like 50 or $52 billion for the British Petroleum stake. And we reasoned, okay, the Russians are going to pay for it with treasury bonds. So they're going to dump treasury bonds to pay for the British stake in a Russian firm, an energy firm. This is really getting out of control. The Fed is going to have to continue soaking up these dumped treasury bonds because the deals everywhere in the world are involving 
the U.S. dollar in the form of treasury bonds as the currency for the acquisitions. All right, so the construction side of the Holy Grail deal is going to be largely done with U.S. US dollars. But when the sale comes, um, and, you know, like three or four years down the road or whatever, uh, China takes a huge amount of natural gas and they have to pay for it. Well, they're not going to be using dollars unless the Chinese have more treasury bonds to dump. Uh, but down the road, it, it's pretty well understood. The Russian-Chinese transactions are going to be in RMB, the, which is, it, it's catching on as an acronym. It stands for renminbi. It means in Chinese, people's money. It is an equivalent, exactly the same as Chinese yuan currency. So we're going to see a lot more trade. And the Russians, by the way, they told the Europeans, we're not using dollars anymore. You get a sanction uh, slapped against us and our banks and oligarchs and companies. Well, okay, you want to play that game? Well, we can play it too. All your European purchases of the Russian energy, both oil and gas, which is enormous, very significant, it will be done in ruble, yuan, RMB, and in uh, euros. So China... You know Go ahead, Jim. You know, there's an angle to this. Um, some people say, and I, I don't know if you're sure on this, but some people say that once these pipelines are um, finished, it will allow Russia to divert a massive amount of the gas that's currently going to Europe uh, into the Chinese market or Central Asian market. If that's true, then that would change the current balance of power. The balance of power is that Russia can't turn off the gas to Europe you know, without taking a huge hit. Russia's not going to turn off the, the gas. No, I don't think they will. I don't think they will. But you see, my point, though, is that if yeah. they have a, two customers instead of one, it, it raises your power immensely. Well, I think they're going to have two instead of one, exactly, and they're not going to lose Europe. The United States is. How so? How do you think that'll happen? <clears throat> I like to point out Germany. And before we get into any Dutch issue of repatriation of gold, I'd like to tell the, the, the German grand jury indictment charges. First of all, Germany has already agreed, already made pacts, already made pro progress. They're going to join the Eurasian trade zone. They're going to adopt the BRICS gold and, gold and silver backed currency. They're going to align with Russia and China. Germany has already decided this. I don't give a backward flying rat turd what Angela Merkel says regarding sanctions. Totally irrelevant. I know that sounds wild and crazy. The decisions have already been made. Germany is not going to forfeit their industry to satisfy the U.S. fascists and the EU fascists and the other parties that are involved in Ukraine. Germany's not going to give it up. Uh, there are now fabricated stories about German corporate support for the sanctions. I believe they're written by Langley and dumped into the news as quotes from, say, Mittelschaft or Siemens. I've got some German clients who say, no, the CEO or president of Siemens never said that. Those are fabrications by your country. These are from German clients. All right, so what are the four indictment charges by Germany? The first is they don't want NSA infiltration anymore. It's not just uh, bugging Merkel's office. It's far bit deeper than that. It's monitoring the entire German parliament. It's bigger than that, even. It's monitoring the entire Siemens network uh, for cell phone in Germany. The second issue is over gold repatriation. And uh, I'll, I'll get back to this point uh, with a little side story, but just let it be said for now while I'm making my four indictment charges. The Germans are very angry that London and New York sold their official gold account. They're very angry that they've not been able to 
have their delegates from the German parliament visit the New York Fed and see their exact gold with markings and serial numbers. All right, so the Germans are very angry about their allies stealing their gold. The third issue has to do with the rivalry and the conflict and open warfare now on the monetary front between the Bundesbank and the Draghi Euro Central Bank. Uh, Draghi is now proposing a, a $1 trillion dollar uh, bond and asset purchase program on monetized money. Up to now, he's done it on a sterilized manner of draining money while putting more money in on a, and on a net basis, it's, it's zero. Now he's proposing pure unsterilized and the Bundesbank is up in arms. The fourth thing is the Russian sanctions, which we touched on. Uh, there are over 3,000, <clears throat> pardon me, over 3,000 German companies doing business in Russia. They're seeing already big declines in orders, in activity, in their Russian subsidiaries, businesses, and it's not going to stand. So on these four bases, bases, Germany is going to break. And I don't think they're supplying uh, war material, men, fighter jets, and all that for the nonsensical Ukrainian war that the U.S. has sponsored with, with its mercenaries. So Germany's, they're getting ready to get out. Uh, it's going to be extremely complicated for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> first, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> first is that the German uh, constitution, if you will, set up post-World War II involves quite a few provisions and oaths of loyalty to the U.S. by their highest level politicians. Second thing is more practical. The Rammstein Air Force Base is the biggest in all of NATO in Europe. And it's like a sprawling city. It's got the biggest medical facility of all the NATO nations and it's going to get extremely complicated because the Turks are in the same position of flipping east with a lot more openness on their disgust and I point to the Rammstein Air Force Base and the Incirlik Turkish Air Force Base both parts of NATO both very important to the Langley boys for shipping Afghanistan heroin. So it's going to be very difficult for Germany to break loose. It's going to take some kind of a smoking gun. And I don't know for sure, but I, I believe it, it's going to have to do with all four major points that I just made. NSA, gold, the Euro Central Bank, and the Russian sanctions. I think they're going to say, look, we're going to have to rewrite with a, you know, a, a special parliamentary session, kind of like a Continental Congress for Germany, they're going to have to rewrite some of their rules because they're not going to go down the tubes just to satisfy Langley and a, a bunch of American and European elites who want to install a Western totalitarian system and blur all national lines. And this is kind of what the European, I think it's called the TPIP, trade pact. Um, it, it's to put power in the hands of corporations, to give them incredible patent authority and power, and to control and censor the internet, and a whole lot more. And I, I don't think Germany is, is going to want to um, liquidate their national lines any more than they already have. The Dutch and the Germans are making provisions right now for going back to the Gilder and the Deutschmark right now. And here's my quick side story, uh, Paul Plain. The, uh, we all know about the 2011 gold repatriation request. Okay, that was three years ago. But I got, I got some information that was filled in for my benefit a few months ago um, by The Voice, who's a tremendous source of gold and banking information. Why did the Germans ask for their gold to be repatriated in the first place? 
we, we, we focus on the absent repatriation. We don't focus on the motive for the repatriation. What happened? Well, two things. The U.S. got wind, the U.S. government, Department of Treasury, they got wind that Germany was working rather, not, not feverishly, but vigorously toward um, a return to the Deutschmark, which they wanted to have gold backed. And in my work in 2009, I called it the uh, gold backed Nordic Euro. And the Dutch, Austrians, and the Finns, Finland, would go along with it. So in other words, Central Europe would depart the European Monetary Union and dump the Euro currency. All right, so the U.S. got wind of that. And it got antagonistic between Berlin and Washington. The second thing I think is much more of a smoking gun, ugly feature. And that was the U.S. government with its State Department shared with Berlin their plan. This is, remember, this is mid-2011. Their plan they shared with Germany and the, the highest levels of the German government their plan long term for Ukraine of scorched earth, of cutting off the gas lines, of removing Russian uh, interdependence with the European economy and, and its entire union. And the Germans said to Washington, are you out of your minds? And they said, we want our gold back, you idiots. Well, in that scenario, do you think Merkel will last? Is she, uh, where is she, who is she? Where, which side is she on here? Well, most American observers don't realize she comes from East German Stasi, which is their, uh, their equivalent of CIA. Um, so when... Yes, Ger but, but Jim, her father came from West Germany, and I think she was on like a, or he was on a Marshall Fund kind of, you know what I mean, a, kind of a, got a CIA feeling to it. So you know what I mean? It's, and where yeah, she could I, well be in a double agent family is what I'm saying. I, I'm, I know, I know what you're saying, and I, I don't have much more information about, about her identity and background, but uh, she has some closer links to Putin when Putin was in charge of the KGB. So she might be kind of a Trojan horse for the German bankers who are aligned with the London and Wall Street bankers. She might be working much more than we realize toward the BRICS gold currency and toward the Eurasian trade zone unification, formulation, construction than we realize. I have heard that she's already let the powers that be in Germany know that she's going to resign. She's already been told, you must go. And I ask questions like, when? Who told her this? And all I ever hear is, well, the powerful German industrialists. And there are lots of conglomerates there. There are lots of very powerful companies. The Germans are not going to say, okay, we're going to take a, you know, an 8% hit to our economy just because the U.S. wants us to cut off Russia. We're not, they're not going to do that. And as for timing, I don't really know, but the voice has got some contacts in Germany. And I've got a contact in Germany that, that he kind of handed to me back in 2008. Um, and from what I'm hearing, Merkel is really just, she's, she's temporarily sitting in office, just occupying a post for the benefit of being a mouthpiece for the German and Western bankers. And Deutsche Bank, why? Okay, I have a, just a different way of looking at some things. Notice that Deutsche Bank is on the hot seat. Well, they've been on the hot seat for a while. They announced that they, they were getting rid of their London fix for the gold seat. It's well known that they're involved in the LIBOR price rigging. They're up to their ears in gold market fixing. They're all over the place when it comes to the big Western bank criminality. I've been told that Deutsche Bank is going to be split into six or seven, seven separate com companies. 
six or seven separate companies. My theory is this. When the breakup of Deutsche Bank comes, Merkel goes. Wow. That's pretty dramatic. Uh, Jim, you know, just in the last couple of days, the major German media have started giving her a seriously hard time or doing things that tell you something's up because uh, Der Spiegel had a long article on how things got to where they are in the Ukraine, which was remarkably even-handed. And then uh, German national TV, uh, the ARD or whatever, had Putin on for a reasonably fair interview. And, you know, even if you're just neutral, that's dramatically better and pretty damning of what the West has done in the Ukraine. So this is a sign that things are not going her way at all. Well, from what she publicly states, how do you know what she does behind the closed doors? Well, that's the thing. I don't know if she's a double, triple agent. I mean, there's just no way of telling who she is. And, and you know, we'll, we'll never resolve it. And, and even when she's gone, I don't think we'll know. But I guess this kind of segues into another topic for tonight, which is the um, – the issue of like stress within the EU, or is the EU, is the euro, are these going to hold together? What do you think is going to happen? Well, <clears throat> I try not to get too much involved with the German politics. I just focus on German banking and industry. Mm -hmm. I do a financial newsletter. I, I don't do a political one. And, and to right. be sure, I cannot avoid the politics sometimes, especially mm -hmm. when you have too big to fail banks and banker welfare and all that. It has already been decided that Germany will leave the EU. It has already been decided that Germany will leave NATO. We've just got a lot of details and a lot of rubbish and broken trucks on the road blocking that path. It's already been decided. I've got it from two independent sources that Germany has already agreed leave the common euro and join the BRICS gold-backed currency, gold and silver, the BRICS new currency, and join the Eurasian trade zone <clears throat> and allow their Frankfurt RMB hub center to flourish. They will close down the European Central Bank Draghi offices in Frankfurt. They're at direct odds with the Bundesbank. Which do you think will prevail? The Bundesbank, they've already decided to get out. I'm not wondering if it's going to happen. I'm wondering when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, what trigger event will per permit it to happen. Watch Deutsche Bank. It, it could be the trigger event for a lot of lost German old line Western banker connection. And let me put out as a footnote. <clears throat> In 1998, a very important acquisition took place in the banking world. Uh, I remember back in, in the 80s, I was working at Digital Equipment Corporation, and one of our main focus groups was Bankers Trust. Another one was Broken Hill Properties. Can you say BHP Billiton, the Australian conglomerate? All right, so the Digital had some very big clients back then. And I didn't get much word of what, what's going on with Bankers Trust. What I heard was that they're involved in a lot of background banking activity, shall we say. And we used to joke around. I say, well, I, I wonder if they're involved in anything, you know, weird, criminal, or whatever. And I always got shouted down by my manager. No, Jim, really, come on. This is Bankers Trust. They're a prestigious company. They're closely aligned with the central bank. And I said, well, what makes you think that that's good? Anyway, Bankers Trust got sold. It was, it was nicknamed in Wall Street the Central Bank's Bank. Okay, that's where all the Wall Street derivatives were housed in the 1990 decade. Uh, kind of a side project by Robert Rubin. I never say the Clinton administration. I say the Clinton-Rubin administration because it was Rubin <clears throat> who brought about the 0% leasing for gold as Treasury Secretary. Uh, it was Rubin who he headed up all the derivative projects 
which I call the whirling dervish of uh, supposed mass. There's no mass. There's no asset foundation to the U.S. banking system anymore. It's just a bunch of spinning derivatives uh, on computer trades. All right, so <clears throat> Germany bought, the Deutsche Bank bought Bankers Trust. Why? To export the derivatives so they could include all of Europe and get it out of U.S. regulatory oversight. So Deutsche Bank is extremely important. And as, as it goes and gets broken up, watch to see a lot of things happen in a, a domino sequence. I don't have it all lined out uh, and arranged. It's, it's very murky because we don't know what's going on. But Deutsche Bank is involved in all of these big rigging cases, LIBOR, gold, forex. And they're all interrelated. I think Deutsche Bank has just got months to go. And so does Merkel. <clears throat> well, months would be a long time because the war, the situation in the Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's going to collapse soon. You're going to have millions of refugees heading into, Ru into uh, Europe. Well, yeah, they're going to head into Hungary and Bulgaria and Romania. You think they're going to make it to Austria? No, I think they're going into Poland first. <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, Poland deserves that. Well, been they've been partly behind it. and um, Yes. But, but, I mean, setting aside that, I'm just saying that the mess there is likely to get, to get dramatically worse in, let's say, two months. I mean, dramatically. Yes. I have and, a forecast. Paul, I have a forecast standing right now. It's been in, in force now for a couple months that by the end of the year, uh, Ukraine will fall. Uh, the regime will fall. And it'll be mostly over a failed harvest. But now I'm hearing it, it, it's a lot more than that. It's fuel, it's toilet paper, and it's food. Look, it's going to be so grim, it isn't, it's not even funny. But the point is that it's got the EU's you know, fingerprints all over the murder weapon, is what I'm saying. It's not going to be a pretty sight. Exactly. So that, and from that, though, where does the euro or, or for that matter, the ruble, what, what, what do you see like the, the economics playing out? Let's say that your forecast happens. The end of the year, around that time, the Ukraine more or less just <laughs> collapses into the snow. Um, what are the repercussions? What will happen economically, let's say, coming from Europe? That's a tough question. I can only speculate. I, I got some ideas on that. I, I believe that the, uh, the first victim will be their currency. They're, they're not going to know what to use. And anything they do use will be devaluated into oblivion. So they're going to have some severe inflation problems, which begs the question, are, are they going to maybe adopt the euro? I mean, if they want to be this problem child for the EU, are they going to be able to use the euro when things get really tough? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But they don't have any central bank gold because the United States stole it, 33 tons of gold. That's part of what's going on here. I mean, Libya was moving along swimmingly under Gaddafi. He's a strange bird. He was until he got disemboweled. What did the United States want from Libya? 144 tons of gold. There's a gold angle to Cyprus. It's where the Russians were discharging their treasury bonds and converting to gold bullion. So we made up a story about, you know, insolvent Cyprus banks and a bail-in project. I mean, it's good. These it's good to be king, Jim. It's good to be king. They uh, they set the rules and they go kill people and steal their gold. Right. Um, so if if Ukraine doesn't have gold and seventy billion dollars of oligarch money is sitting in Swiss banks, how on earth can they ever get their economy going? When you know, I think the biggest new cottage industry in Ukraine is going to be black market human organs. Now that's already a big. Market no, no, that's... I mean, I mean, much bigger. They've mm -hmm. got, you know, maybe 10, 20, 30,000 dead. And they've got lots of limbs in the forests and dumping grounds that don't include the organs. So I think we're, they've got, uh, I mean, I, I've got a client, he's in Zurich, and he said, Jim, almost every day I drive by the airport. And I see a Ukrainian hangar 
and there's always activity. They're flying in and out all the time. What do you suppose they're doing there? And I said, I don't know. Maybe they're bugging out. It's the families of the regime leaders. And then we talked more, and he said, do you think they're moving a lot of their, their personal possessions? I said, sure, but maybe they're moving a lot of human organs. Don't, don't forget uh, prost prostitutes, Jim. They actually just uh, put a motion to legalize prostitution as well. Well, that, that could be, but uh, anyway, regardless, the infrastructure in Ukraine is ruined. I've got a... Uh, I've got a, he's not a client, his name is Jaroslav, and he's in St. Petersburg. He's a, a really smart fellow, and he's got a lot of connections, and he knows people in Ukraine. And um, I've got another Hungarian client, a paying client, and he keeps me informed on what's going on in Ukraine, because he has contacts there. And from what I hear, the infrastructure is wrecked. Uh, I'm not talking about highways, I'm talking about railways, too. Uh, and I don't believe their, their supply network for say diesel is up to the task for completing their harvest. I don't think nice. their trucks are ready to complete the task for harvest. So they're having a skyrocketing price inflation problem now with food and fuel and there is no toilet paper. Uh, the, the troops from Ukraine, from the, the center, from Kiev, who are fighting in the east are mostly surrounded without provision of supplies and they're they're just laying down their weapons and marching toward the Russian line and Russia's not you know castrating them or executing or beheading them they're just saying all right you know we realize you got caught on the wrong side here's a warm meal and a blanket you know get, fix yourself up the Russians are going to come out here as the winner and I, I I don't I think Ukraine's going to get cut in half I think it's, there's going to be a Western half and an Eastern half. It's going to be a Russian speaking and a Ukraine speaking. Uh, there's not a great deal of difference between the, the languages. You, I'm hearing from some, uh, I got one client, believe it or not, who's living in a Kiev suburb. <laughs> and I've got another client in the United States whose wife comes from Kiev. So I've been instructed, shall I say, that the Ukrainian language is really a cross between some Slavic languages and doesn't have a lot of uniqueness. Uh, but anyway, I think the West is going to take Western Ukraine. Remember, it's got its farmlands in the West and it's got its industry in the East. Russia's going to retain its industry connections that have been supplying for a long time the Russian military there in the East. The West wants the farmlands and they're going to try their, their best to bring in the Monsanto seeds so they can, you know, do whatever they can to, to penetrate the rush. I'm sorry, the, the penetrate the European food market with all the genetically modified organisms. Ukraine could be important for that for Monsanto. By the way, a, by the way, Costa Rica has neither chemtrails nor Monsanto foods. Uh oh. Now you're getting people tempted. By the way, I agree with that. I've traveled around Central America and South America, and I haven't seen very many at all. I, I haven't seen a chemtrail in eight full years. But I'm told by a couple people who, who have experience in Guanacaste, which is a northwestern province of Costa Rica along the Pacific, that they have in the past, two or three years ago, seen a bunch of streaks across the sky but not anymore. Hmm. All right, that's just a little side comment. Well, well, why don't we get into gas and oil? Because that's, <clears throat> and of course that gets into the petrodollar. So with this turmoil in Central Eastern Europe, what do you see happening to, let's say, the gas market? <sighs> well, I mean, the first thing you have to comment on is Ukraine. Um, Ukraine is... They're, they're a very, very troublesome <clears throat> nation when it comes to the gas market. They're siphoning gas. Uh, one of the issues Russia had, I mean, Russia, it, part of Russia's motivation, they're saying, well, gosh, it's glad, I'm, we're glad someone else brought attention to Ukraine because uh, we have an excuse to cut them off now because they've been siphoning and stealing gas for you know, a decade or two. 
Russia's playing an interesting chess game regarding the gas market there. They're, they're actually saying now that maybe we won't complete the South Stream pipeline that will go through Hungary, Bulgaria, and Austria to make its way to Germany. All roads lead to Germany. All roads, LNG roads, gas roads, oil roads, railways, all lead to Germany. It's the center of Europe industrially. It's the biggest economy. It's the most powerful industrial sector. They got export trade surpluses. All right, so I don't really know exactly what's going to happen with the the European gas market, but I've been assured Russia will not cut off gas to the European market. They're going to continue to threaten to use it in order to get the Europeans to break away from the U.S. and NATO and even kill the European Monetary Union, the common euro common euro currency. And so I, I don't know what's going to happen, but we get a lot of conflict that, that's really, you know, my attention is not so much on Ukraine so much. It's on the Iranian gas pipelines that are now blocked by ISIS in, in northeastern Iraq and blocked by the extreme, extraordinary conflicts going on in Syria. So if the U.S., succeeds in making a permanent war zone in Kurdistan in, within Iraq and Syria with this ISIS tool, which, by the way, is a Langley asset, completely controlled by Langley, and that is uh, coming out slowly. The control center for Langley on ISIS activity is the U.S. Embassy in Turkey, Ankara, Turkey, and the, Turkeys, the Turks are pretty well ready to boot them out. I, I don't know how it's going to happen. It's hard to boot out a, an embassy. That, that's an extreme uh, measure to take. But the Iranian gas line uh, must make it to the Mediterranean in order to supply uh, the European market. And now the Israelis, believe it or not, have just struck a royalty deal with Syria. Wow. The Israelis control the Tamar floating platform for gas production offshore in the Mediterranean. So these things are all interwoven. And the Saudis did what they could uh, a year ago. They interrupted the funding and the contract work for the Iranian-Pakistan gas pipeline. That'll be revived, just a matter of time. I don't know what's going to happen with the uh, the gas market. I'm, I'm much more focused on... Um, on the, uh, the, the petrodollar. Uh, I think the Saudis are very misunderstood right here playing. Um, we, we hey, hear hey, Jim. Yeah. Uh, the latest I heard was that the, uh, the Israelis are trying to cut off the uh, Russians from the European market and they want to build a pipeline through Cyprus to uh, pipe the Leviathan gas into Europe. What are, have you heard anything on that? Yeah, it would uh, supply Cyprus, Greece, and Italy. Um, well, that that's fine. Um, the the part that's the biggest challenge is construction, and then the second biggest part is what's the volume. And, and then there's a complication because Israel has a standing contract with Russian Gazprom. One yeah. third one third of all Israeli citizens are from Russia. Little known fact by the American followers who really don't follow jack shit. Well, it's it's interesting though that it seems the Israelis and a lot of the Israeli oligarchs are supporting the uh, Ukrainian um, side in that conflict. It's <laughs> it's bizarre. Well, I, I wouldn't make the mistake of regarding Israel as a homogeneous entity. The fascist element of Israel is supporting and supplying people, staff, in Kiev. But there's another side of Israel that I think will prevail. It's the side that doesn't like Bibi, Netanyahu. Um, it's the side that made the Gazprom contract. Uh, it, it's it's kind of like Germany. Germany is not homogeneous. you got the industrialists versus the bankers. The bankers are aligned with the politics. Uh, in Israel, you've got the fascists, and then you've got the, um, I don't know what to call them, more fair-minded fair capitalists, the, the democratic element. And the fair-minded 
have already cut a contract with Gazprom. So any any additional pipeline that goes to Cyprus and into Greece and Italy, my guess is it will work in concert with Gazprom, not in opposition. Well, what about the the petrodollar then? One of your favorite topics. Was that is, it a looking, <laughs> is it looking healthy? <laughs> no, it's looking dead. Well, um, there's so much. It's to still say. walking, though. <laughs> it might be a dead man, but he's still walking. So how's it? What's what's happening to it? I think it's crawling. I don't think it's walking. I think it's on all fours. Um, first of all, about a year ago, some big events happened in Saudi Arabia where it was quite clear that a break had occurred, a divorce had occurred between Riyadh and Washington. Um, the divorce is pretty clear. The, back a year ago, I pointed out a number of different individual events. Um, we've got now some detente between Iran and Saudi Arabia. I believe the Chinese told the two parties, look, make nice, stop the propaganda, stop lying about each other. Realize that we, we both, you both as nations want to uh, improve commerce, reduce the war threat. So ignore the Americans, give them lip service and tell them to screw. Make nice or we're gonna give you both problems because now the Chinese Navy is patrolling the Persian Gulf and and the, the outer waters, uh, what's that? And that's not exactly the Indian Ocean, but you know what I mean. <clears throat> so there have been monthly meetings since about March this year between ministers of Saudi Arabia and ministers of China. And it, they're happening in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing. Monthly, I call them love fests. They're talking about wonderful cooperation, cultural exchanges, funding of new projects, banking facilities, uh, projects back in Saudi Arabia, the gigantic petrochemical project that the Russian, I'm sorry, that the Chinese are funding. So the U.S. threw the Saudis under the bus. And I don't care about these photo ops with King Abdullah and, and John Kerry, the Secretary of State, the absolute joke of the Secretary of State, the only bigger joke we had was Hillary. I don't care about photo ops, I care about events. And an event that preceded the Kerry photo op in Riyadh was an Obama summit meeting with King Abdullah that lasted no more than 15 minutes. A complete disaster. And I reason that something happened with Obama and King Abdullah and my sources give me pieces of information, we try to put it together, and we conclude that the Saudis were complaining about ISIS. And they didn't want it to come back to Saudi and cause a regime change among the Saudi royals in charge. And Obama told them, no, F you, we're in charge, do as we say, don't worry, ISIS is our tool. ISIS will not cross your border, and they already have. Okay, so that's part of the divorce. But here's the big element that's not in the news regarding the Saudis and why the divorce was made final. Two years ago, the Saudis caught wind of their gold in the Swiss banks being stolen by London and Washington, New York, Wall Street and London, the, the, the bankers. What happened was we had a big smokescreen story. I mean, I really seriously mean this. Any very large event that happens in the financial world has a gold hidden angle. The United States went after UBS in Switzerland and claimed that they had a lot of foreign accounts and illegal accounts and tax dodging accounts and you know all kinds of different violations. So basically the Department of Treasury in the United States took control of UBS in 2011. And I, I looked to see, well, what's behind all this? You don't just, you know, the, the official story is nonsense. They wanted to, what, capture maybe a hundred million dollars in tax revenue? Well, that's a thousand times below 
what makes it critical, a hundred billion. A hundred million dollars is diddly squat lunch money for the Wall Street crowd, lunch money. They spend $200 per lunch per person. I'm not sure, add it all up, it might come up to, you know, several dozen million dollars. Okay, 100 million in tax money from the Swiss bank, that's, that's irrelevant. What was really behind it, and I came to learn, that's where a lot of Saudi gold was hidden. Not hidden, but uh, stored in the allocated gold accounts in Switzerland. Well, it was largely stolen. Now, what was the story several months ago regarding Swiss banks? Again, the same line of BS. Credit Suisse, foreign accounts, tax dodging, illegal secrecy, blah, blah, blah. Well, I dug a little further and, and learned, okay, looks like the U.S. government wants to fold control of Credit Suisse under UBS. And I said, well, sounds like they want the rest of the Saudi gold. And I learned, no, it's more than that. They want the entire Gulf region emirate gold. Now, I did a little homework back in uh, June or so when the Saudis announced an independent sovereign wealth fund to be created, independent of their central bank, for conversion of their um, heavily loaded dollar-based assets to diversify. And I thought, okay. I got confirmation it was to convert treasury bonds into gold. That's the Saudis. All right, so this is all part of the aftermath of the, the, the divorce of Riyadh with Washington. Uh, then I came to learn from just simple research, you know, Google search. Let's just list all the Emirates nations from the Gulf and let's search for their sovereign wealth funds. And I came to learn that half of the 2.2 trillion in total was just the UAE, United Arab Emirates. Not quite half, I think it was a little more than a trillion. 900 something billion, a huge amount of money. UAE is different from Saudis. They don't have a huge population with lots of Islamic reform pressure, lots of women's rights. They don't have that. They've got a much smaller population and a huge bank account. So the Americans in London, the Wall Streeters, Wall Street and London bankers are stealing Gulf Emirate gold in Switzerland. It's heading straight to the refineries and going straight from there to Hong Kong and Beijing and Shanghai. And the Saudis don't like it. So that's why they created their sovereign wealth fund for converting treasuries, because they still own a stinking bunch of treasury bonds. I would estimate that, and we tried to search this down, and it, it's hard for my, my gang to get exact numbers, but we think something like two-thirds of the 2.2 trillion of Gulf Emirate Sovereign Wealth Fund is in dollar denomination, and the great majority of that is in treasury bonds. They got some big banks, you know, like Prince Wallaweed or whatever his name is. I like to call him Prince Dickweed. They have some Citigroup bank stock and bank bonds, a lot of investments in Wall Street, but they don't add up to anywhere near 100 billion. So the majority so, is in treasury bonds. So I take it, Jim, you totally disagree with the angle that uh, Saudis are just doing Washington's bidding to hurt Russia? I think they're doing China's bidding to earn a lower energy cost and a lower price on the Holy Grail deal with, with, uh, with Russia. Also, with these sanctions that are all interrelated with Washington's agenda, uh, the sanctions that Russia had on, on a countermeasure, all these agribusiness businesses in Southern Europe, you think China's going to buy them up? This all works to China's favor. I believe Saudi Arabia is doing China's bidding. They want to keep a low energy cost to their expanding economy. The United States is going to suffer deeply to the damage to the entire shale oil sector and their junk bonds are about to explode, a new subprime. It's not just car loans and student loans in the United States, it's shale sector loans. They're all going to blow up. Okay, so how wise would it be for, for Saudi Arabia to make enemies of Washington and the West and Russia at the same time? I mean, that's got to shorten their life expectancy, I would think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the Saudis are caught in the middle. Um, they just cut a deal in the last month with Russia 
on pricing of oil. Can you say moving away from the COMEX and the WT West Texas paper, paper crude oil pricing system? <clears throat> the Saudis are about to introduce a Russian pricing system in Chinese RMB. Okay, you mentioned that they're in trouble, they're, you know, caught in a vice and whatever you want, however you want to describe it. Yes, that is why I believe the Saudis are talking nice to Kerry and not having his head cut off. They're talking nice with Washington. They're allowing ISIS to cross their border. They're very careful with what's going on in Mideast developments, especially ISIS. They're tolerating the, the theft of the Saudi gold in Switzerland by London, New York. And behind the scenes, they're working feverishly to make friends with the, the Iranians, to avoid conflict with Russia. The number one and number two oil producers, Saudi and Russia, are going to set the oil price. They're going to ignore the American influence for setting that price. And they're going to accept Chinese RMB in sales and watch the Chinese, I'm sorry, watch the Saudis accept RMB and other currencies besides the dollar from the Europeans. Iran ditto. So when can we expect the Saudi spring? <laughs> I think the Saudi spring has already, already started. Um, notice that uh, Prince Bandar was dismissed and then he was rehired. They, they're going through a lot. They're, they're really stuck in a vice. Uh, this is not simple for the Saudis. They must, without a very strong military and defense system, allow for a transition of the American devils and bring in the Chinese devils. <laughs> it's it's well, not going to be easy. It's quite a tightrope act, isn't it? It is, and they've got to be careful for not getting knocked off. Uh, there have been some explosions inside Riyadh inside Saudi Arabia, in, in Metro Riyadh. And I reason that those are Langley warnings. Toe the line. So the pressure is building. And ISIS is, ISIS is blamed for the, for the explosions in Riyadh, but I believe it's Langley using it, ISIS. So, Jim, what, where does Iran fit in? Iran... Is try, I mean, China and Russia are trying to get Iran and, and Saudi Arabia to work out their differences, right? Yeah. And so where do you, what do you see Iran being up to? Can they get a pipeline to Europe or, you know, to the Mediterranean? Is that impossible? I don't know. I think uh, they've got a greater likelihood of completing the Pakistan pipeline. Uh, all they need to do is get the Saudis to get rid of their blockade. It's blockade of funding and contractors. Uh, the Saudis are really quite an interesting nation when it comes to petrochemical business. They've got uh, a lot of engineers, and they're Western taught. They they bring in Norwegians at, at times to, you know, ramp up their their uh, expertise level. But I think Iran is already in the Chinese and Russia camp, firmly in the camp. They've got a, quite a lot of nuclear technology uh, contracts with Russia. Ever since the 2012 U.S. government sanctions against Iran, the Russians have been right in their backyard. And, and I think the Russians are going to do everything they can to make sure that the United Nations gets off Iran's back. And as far as China is concerned, I think they're Iran's biggest oil and gas customer. They've got gigantic investments in the, in the oil and gas um, businesses, projects, giant projects in Iran. Iran is a large country of 75 million, three times the population of Iraq. They've, they've got some, some problems to be sure, and, and the U.S. makes sure that their Iranian real currency is going to hell in a handbasket, causing price inflation. And the natives are 90% in Iran aligned against the government and mullahs. The Iranian government has their own Swiss accounts. The Iran government mullahs have gigantic Swiss accounts. 
I don't know in what form they're kept. I can't say, well, they're this percent treasuries and this percent gold and this percent euro bonds. I don't know. For all I know, they're just cash deposits sitting in Swiss banks with no specific investment portfolio strategy. I don't know. But Russia and China are already very firm partners with Iran. And Iran is a huge supplier of crude oil to China, Korea, and Japan, all. And it's not being done in dollars. Hmm. What else do you think is important in the petrodollar war? Do you think we'll see a collapse in shale production and all that quickly? Uh, it's hard to say. It depends a lot on the funding. Um, I, I don't know how quickly these junk bonds are going to fail. Um, I've said pretty much, I'm looking at some notes recently cobbled together. I don't know that there's a whole lot more for me to say about the petrodollar and the Saudi angle and all that. Um, I, I do believe that the Saudis are doing something clever. They're using the U.S. cover to try to kill OPEC. I don't think they like OPEC. I think it's outserved, outlived its purpose, outlived its usefulness. Um, I'd like to point out Nigeria. And, and to begin with, there, there's something called the, the, the mint nations. Um, I believe the BRICS are trying to court the mint nations of Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. Notice Nigeria is in there. Um, Nigeria is having a big problem. Their currency is going, going to hell. It's something like 15, 20% decline. Uh, it's declining more than the, the, the oil price in dollar terms. They're, they're having some severe uh, hot money issues in Nigeria. I mean, they've got their other problem. There's not an honest Joe running, <laughs> running around anywhere in their government. <laughs> they're just a pack of extreme, extraordinary criminals. But my point is that Nigeria is about to break down. And when they break down, you're going to start seeing a new phenomenon in OPEC. Um, BRICS are going to court the mint, four nations, to, to join. I don't think full, full membership like the original BRICS nations. But the phenomenon that's going to happen with the OPEC is they're going to discard the dollar for their oil sales. And it might be simultaneous with the Saudis. Iran already did. Hmm. And then you got this new ISIS <laughs> oil production. Well, well, okay, what about uh, other countries being blown up though, like uh, Boko Haram and all that, all these, you know, explosions in Nigeria or whatever. Um, do you think that basically the U.S. is going to attack some of these countries, or what? I, I don't know. Are, are we running out of countries to attack? Well, well we not... haven't invaded Venezuela yet. I mean, geez, I mean, come on. <laughs> are you sure? Well, we've been sending in hitmen and all kinds of other things. <laughs> right, right. Can you, can you say with certainty that uh, Chavez wasn't taken out? No, that's okay. entirely possible. That's okay, entirely. well, I, I think we're all over that, that area, but we, we're limited in what we can do. It has to be covert because the Russian Navy is all over Venezuela. The Russians are surrounding North America right now. Uh, Chinese how and so? Russians get... Hmm? How, how so? I mean, uh, they're occasionally doing drills, but are they actually doing it like every day kind of thing? Well, the Russians have tight relations with Venezuela. The Russians right. are working out to deal with Cuba. Uh, the Russians have now been the first entry into Mexico, which relaxed their Pemex foreign consultant law. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all pretty significant. The, the Russians are they're involved in Brazil. Mm -hmm. China gets the relations, and then they open the door for Russia. Russia's got all kinds of uh, agricultural deals now with South America. I think Russia wrote the deal with Cuba on their 
billion dollar uh, infrastructure aid. That was about May. The uh-huh. Russian for Cuba. I think they wrote it in so that if there's any dropped ball by Cuba, Russia can build up the Mariel base and make a naval base. Mm-hmm. So Russia's all over the place. Well, clearly they're uh, on the march militarily. They, their military budget has increased dramatically. Um, no question about that. And um, so has their leap in technology. They've got technology in the Russian Navy now that disables the U.S. Navy targeting systems. It was demonstrated in the Black Sea in June, and it caused pissing in the pants at the Pentagon. I've heard that. I've heard they've got a lot of, uh, they've done a number of demonstrations where they've uh, disabled radar and other things. And I guess that one case with the uh, USS S. Cook or whatever, they totally disabled the whole boat or whatever. But um, I tell you what, before we uh, wrap it up and get to the last topic in terms of anything you might want to say on BRICS that uh, our listeners might want to hear, um, for example, in Brazil, it looks like the U.S. or whoever made a tremendous attempt to influence the election, but they failed. Yes. Right? I think that's relevant. They may have assassinated the one guy, and then, well, anyway, you can, if, if you want to comment on that. There have been approximately 20 assassinations by the U.S. government of South American leaders. That is over the last two decades. So this is not new, and it's not a new accusation or a wild-eyed claim. Uh, Dilma Rousseff won. She did not win a mandate. I don't think she got over 52% of the votes. But one of her first act and deeds is to create a, a bilateral agreement with Argentina for no more dollar settle- settlement in trade. Okay, so the BRICS have a very firm... Uh, anchor in South America, watch all South America follow suit. The Mercosur, think of it as Mercado Sur, the South market, South American market. Mercosur, (coughs) pardon me, is going to follow the Brazilian trade pattern. And I'm looking for a unique situation where the BRICS funds can come in and offer some aid to Argentina in exchange for, say, a significant stake like 20 or 30 percent in some of the major industries of Argentina and help turn that country around and get it off the U.S. dollar shackles. The BRICS have two very important funds, and there's another fund that's not exactly BRICS but is closely aligned to the Asians. Uh, the two BRICS funds are called the New Development Fund, and each of these is, is a $200 billion fund. I'm told that the New Development Fund for the BRICS is now half funded. It's got $100 billion. And I, when I raise the issue of, well, what are they going to do with $200 billion for a development fund? At first, we heard, well, there's going to be a Tanzanian railroad that that, uh, they will finance. Well, there's going to be a Kenyan railroad that they're going to finance. Well, there's a Nigerian railroad that they're going to finance. In other words, build up the railway infrastructure uh, along uh, major routes in Africa. Then I I heard, well, they're going to work out some deals and, and really improve the Nigerian ports. Well, they're going to work out something and, and improve the Angola ports. Well, they're going to try to get some kind of of order in Congo. And I said, all right, well, look, uh, I'm pretty good at fourth grade arithmetic. Uh, I add up all these billions for the railway railway projects, and I add up some of the port facilities, and I, I get, you know, somewhere around 20 or 30 billion dollars. So I'm going to repeat the question. Where's all the 200 billion dollars going to go? for the development fund. And then the the truth was sort of leaked out. Um, The the voice is a gold broker. And I teased him and said, 
I'm beginning to believe here, sir, that the development fund for the BRICS is going to start out with a billboard of infrastructure development across the world and emerging markets and other markets that want to get integrated with the Eurasian trade zone and other things and, you know, just build up, lift up their economic structures and stuff like that. But that's the billboard. The other 80% of that $200 billion is going to go into the BRICS gold central bank. And he said, bingo. So the new development fund is going to have one small part, <laughs> maybe the, the cable, fiber optic cable, uh, alternative internet system global. That the NSA uh, can't spy on. <laughs> well, I don't care if they spy on it at all. It, 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 they will have to cut it in order to stop it. And they're not going to be able to do to do that because uh, it's it's not going to be technologically all that challenging to do. It just has to be done, and they've already made progress on it. All right, so the development fund is a hidden gold sourcing central bank, and the BRICS need this central bank to back their currency, and they need it to back the gold trade notes, which are essentially going to operate as letters of credit. All right, second fund, the crisis reserve arrangement fund. It's going around being called the CRA fund. I like, I like calling it the, uh, the crisis management fund. If they have a run in one of the BRICS major nations on their sovereign debt, their bonds, or their stock market, or their currency, those are the three big things in finance, bonds, stocks, currency. Well, this $200 billion fund, which I believe is also half funded, has $100 billion in it, well, then they can... You know, what they could have done in the past was to prevent the Asian meltdown in 1995 in Thailand. That's the sort of thing they want to prevent. For instance, right now, India occasionally has some big problems with their current account deficit, runs on the rupee. Um, the Russians are having a run on the ruble. So this fund could address that and provide some aid short term to bolster the economy create a, not so much a firewall as a moat, a wall, to prevent further damage. And I think it's going to have a lot of value. The third fund is called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. And, you know, this is not a BRICS fund, but it's going to be overlapping a lot, I think, uh, with the, uh, the BRICS development fund. I have a, a sneaky feeling. This is just a gut feeling. I can't prove this, but I believe the BRICS development fund is going to be used outside of Asia. And I believe the independent Asian infrastructure investment bank will be used in Asia. In other words, the BRICS development bank does not have to worry about funding Asian projects. And believe, believe me, the Japanese have something like a, a trillion dollars in, in their reserves. They got a huge amount of, of treasury bonds. They're, they're sitting in various forms like the pension fund, but they can fund a lot of projects. It might cost them on the interest rate side. Uh, nothing is for free. You always have a, you know, you put out a lot of money. And when, by the way, when these BRICS treasury bonds get put aside and buy up gold, you're going to have an impact with the treasury bond market. And I think we already saw some evidence of this. The BRICS, I think, were using Belgium as a warehouse, a clearinghouse that was noticed. The Belgian bulge of $440 billion in treasury bonds, I came to learn that was largely BRICS treasury bonds held in reserves moved in order to help the project of sourcing BRICS gold for their central bank. And why did the United States attack BNP Paribas? It's, it stands for Banque Nationale de Paris. It's the French Paris, Parisian bank. Why did the U.S. go after BNP Paribas? Because they were facilitating in the BRICS treasury bonds 
loading up in the warehouse in Belgium that got noticed and used, being used to source gold, and that all got blocked. So the BRICS nations are not going to be deterred or stopped. They're going to be just delayed. Well, you know that uh, uh, recovery fund or whatever? That sounds like the anti-Soros fund. You know what I mean? It's kind of like the exact opposite, and so it's kind of like the exact opposite of what we have now. Um, yeah, I got a question for you. Uh, we could wrap it up on this, but in a sense, we're talking about the death of the petrodollar here. Do you really think this can be achieved peacefully? Can, can we avoid a war out of this? You mean like in... Uh... Well, I mean, you know, just historically speaking, number one doesn't like to become number two or three or four. You know, well, I called it the global money war report in 2008 because I expected war, not only financial war, but hot war. We have war. We had a little war in Libya. We had some more skirmishes in Egypt. We're having a war in Syria. We had a little financial war in Cyprus. We're having a constant cold war with Iran. Well, now we have a hot war in Ukraine. So when you ask if we're having a war, I, I wonder, well, how do you define war? We already have them. I know you mean a bigger conflagration, supposedly. Um, yes. I, don't think, I don't think we'll have that. Um, I, I think um, this gets into a very sensitive area, and I, I don't want to show my hand, but I don't think, I don't think nuclear bombs can be used anymore. And you think there's high tech to stop them? I think there's there are obstructions that I really don't want to discuss much. And it, it, it leaves the United States to be forced into conventional war. And now they're realizing that the nuclear bombs perhaps are off the table. And the radar systems are not our superiority, and the cruise missile is surpassed by the Russian Sunburn and Onyx. So the U.S. is stuck with ground war, attrition war, and financial war. And with the rejection of the dollar, we will lose the financial war. I don't think we're going to have a con conflagration. Russia, Putin, and the Kremlin did not take the bait. No, they didn't. They set they're the playing. trap. They yeah, they're the just. Trap. Yeah, exactly. They, they're just kind of saying, "Grab it, have fun, watch everybody there hate you, and then uh, we'll pick up the pieces as we see fit." Right. You you said something very important. Let everybody hate you. All of Eastern Europe is watching Ukraine. Yes. All of Eastern Europe is going to turn to the Eurasian trade zone. All they have to see is the failure in Kiev and Ukraine. We're not going to get a better government in the next several months in Kiev. We're going to get a different criminal oligarch. I think in two more regimes, we'll get something constructive in Ukraine. But the U.S. will get some of its mission accomplished with scorched earth and wrecked Ukraine. But they did not destroy the infrastructure for the gas pipelines. Russia did not cut off the, the gas supply to Europe. And the West did not blow up the pipelines. Russia did not make a real, real big issue out of the siphoned, stolen gas. They just cut off because, hey, Kiev wasn't paying the bill. You know, it's, a, it's like your utility company cutting off your your electricity, your gas, they didn't come in and blow your house up. They just cut you off. Okay, so you have to seek out alternative forms of, 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 of energy. Th there's all kinds of shortages in Ukraine. I think a very big turning point is going to come when Ukraine regime falls. And I've been hearing for two months that the Ukrainian leaders are already leaving Ukraine and with some of the IMF money. And Poroshenko, the uh, president of Ukraine, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. he's got a price on his head. I don't think he's going to make it out of, out of this except feet first in a box. Well, Jim, the other thing is, you know, 
the way things look there, you've got two major factions. You've got the oligarchy of, you know, people like Poroshenko, but you've also got the radical nationalist Nazi types. And those guys want to get rid of him, and they may. Um, they so may that's clean another their own. They may clean their own house. I agree. But oh, hey, you not, know one last, you know one last but, thing that. But, but, but let me finish. Let me, let me, let me, they're not going to clean. They're going to clean their house, but they're not going to make it in order. It, it's going to be a different <laughs> criminal. Well, that's what they got with the original coup d'état. It's a different criminal. By the end of 2015, or maybe in early 16, we might actually get a popular leader with Russian support that is friendly to the Europeans. Let's hope so. They, they need it. <clears throat> you know, uh, one last thing to, to end on. Um, I follow the Russian media a lot. And uh, routinely now when Russian uh, leaders, you know, Putin or the foreign minister or somebody go to a country, they give them gifts of uh, Russian cell phones that can't be tapped by the NSA. <laughs> yeah. And so you think about that, and I think they're probably giving them out to everybody in Europe. Here, please. <laughs> well, I believe that might have some of similar technology that the Russian MiGs and their Air Force have for, for radar jamming. They've got greater technology in Russia than the United States military. I mean, this is alarming for those who like to wear red, white, and blue jockey shorts. I don't. I'm pure white jockey. <laughs> You're a pure white man, huh? Well, you know, when I think about that, though, Jim, I think there's the other thing. Uh, America went wrong and got all bureaucratic and classified everything, and it's all buried away in some R&D situation somewhere, some lab underground in New Mexico. And so the actual military doesn't get to use it. You well, know, they I, might... have a, I have a parallel point of view. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the fascists in 1963 killed Kennedy. Mm -hmm. I think the fascists developed a lot of South American connections with other fascist nations. We, all, we called it always anti-communists. I mm -hmm. think the fascists that killed Kennedy installed Nixon. I think the fascists then ordered Nixon to get off the gold standard. I think the fascists then brought in their king fascist Kissinger to set up the petrodollar, which is basically an oil-backed dollar. And I think the fascists continued their merry way for 20 more years and then did 9-11, stole the gold there, $100 billion worth of gold. Very few Americans even comprehend World Trade Center was the largest private bank outside the central bank franchise system in the world. It was a bank heist. A hundred billion dollars worth of gold, a hundred billion dollars worth of banker bond, bearer bonds, a hundred billion dollars worth of diamonds sitting in the world's largest private bank in the world in New York City, World Trade Center, 20 trucks removed the gold. Just like, what's the movie with uh, Bruce Willis, Hard to Kill? Hard to Kill number two, second in the series where the villain was Jeremy Irons. There's your World Trade Center theft. They stole it from the New York Fed, changed it a little bit. But there's your MO, there's your entire layout truck after truck loaded with gold. And they went to where? <laughs> the Montreal port. I don't know where they went this time. They stole the gold and kept the game going because they were running low on their own Fort Knox gold that they dumped. Then they had the 9-11 World Trade Center gold. And then they worked out a deal to borrow some gold on a big lease deal with the Chinese. So it's time to wake up, American citizens. You're losing your country. You're about to go into the third world. Yeah, Jim. You know that old saying about how socialism eventually runs out of other people's money? <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, well, maybe fascism runs out of other people's money to steal. <laughs> well, the fascists have a long history. They, they attack without mercy their enemies. They, they just do scorched earth. There's a lot of genocide and, and a lot of... Uh, just ruthless actions on the military scene, like civilian murders. Then the fascists turned to their allies, 
betray them, defraud them. Remember, Western Europe was defrauded. Norwegian uh, pension funds were defrauded. They, they bought into the subprime mortgage bonds from the United States. Lots of nations were defrauded. Now they're buying into this treasury bond bubble. So the U.S. is running out of nations to plunder, and now they're turning to their allies like Japan and the $1.2 trillion pension fund. It's going to end badly. It's going to end in an East Asian currency war. Then all of East Asia will be lined up with the gold standard and the BRICS nations. That's yeah, a I point think... I'd like to close on. Yeah, well, why don't we wrap it up there? That's a good point. I mean, it's uh... – this is not going to have a happy ending, and a lot of people, and as I said, I follow the Russian media a lot, a lot of people in high circles there expect a return to uh, a gold-backed system of some sort. They, there's, no, no, there's no alternative, actually, after the crisis we're entering. Well, Russia so. has 20,000 tons of gold. They're ready. China has over 15,000 tons of gold. They're ready. 1,000 tons a month have been removed from London, heading to points in Asia, largely China, a thousand tons a month from London since March of 2012. That's 30,000 tons. It's not in the news. Why do I know that? Because The Voice was one of their brokers. Well, that's what the news is for, is to not tell us anything, right? So the news is for fabrication of government propaganda. And this is a good point to close on. That's what your newsletter is for. So why don't we close on that? Where can people get information on your newsletter? Well, it's www.goldenjackass.com. No hyphens or periods or dashes or anything here in the middle. Goldenjackass.com. Uh, I have a free page. It's full of um, public articles, but more so in the last two or three years, much more so interviews because I'm, I'm getting invited a lot. I think they've noticed that I've got uh, 80 to 90 percent correct forecast record, whereas most economists are running 20 to 30 percent. Um, so there are a lot of free elements in there of interview links and public articles, but the feature is the hat trick letter. Um, I just had my 10th anniversary in May, so it, it's really coming quite along nicely. I just had a few months ago the 10,000th order. I can't keep them all. People come and go, but uh, I've, I've still got, you know, it's, it's working on, it, it's about 2,700 clients. It, it's significant. I'm very happy with the progress, but the actual hat trick letter consists of two reports each month, the global money war report for high level activity and the golden currency report for ground level activity. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a labor of love. It, it drains me sometimes. I, I meet my friends shortly after posting the second report and they say, Jim, you, you look like you're in a little bit of a daze. And I said, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I recover after maybe 48 hours. I'm, I'm back to normal, whatever that is. But uh, one of the most indispensable activities for me to get back uh, on my feet properly is to take an afternoon nap. I had a couple naps this week, and I'm back. I'm back. I've had some interviews this week, and I'm very happy with how they turned out. I'm glad to be on The Plain Truth. and. It's a lot of fun. I, I, I love the interviews. They're, they're a whole lot more fun than writing a public article, but you know they're fun too. They're more of a quiet exercise. Hmm. Well, in any case, thanks so much for coming, and thanks for uh, all your work, all your research. We do appreciate it. Uh, all our listeners appreciate it. So that's it, folks. It's a wrap. See you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.